okay. Russell, dawned me with a Bible. So we're, we're reading from Mark um, chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. So Jesus calls Levi and eats with the sinners, Levi being Matthew. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the collect uh, tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Hearing this, Jesus said to them, not the healthy who need a doctor, those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So why did Jesus seek out sinners? It's quite a perplexing question. Why did he aim and, and seek out the sinners? Well, one thought on that is that sinners, and particularly the tax collectors that um, he was seeking out here, were very aware of their sin. To be a, a tax collector... Um, at that time, would have been to be hated pretty much by everyone. The tax collectors were pretty evil people who would make their money um, by adding to the taxes that were, were owed. So they were hated people. And clearly and easily they, could, they knew what they were doing. So if someone said to you, are you a, are you a sinner? You might think, well, I, I, I don't do many bad things, but, but they knew that they were stealing from people and that they were making money from probably from the poor and for, you know, uh, for people that could least afford to, to pay this money. So they knew that they were sinners. And for Jesus, um, Jesus can only save self-confessed sinners who repent. Can't. Gospel is about uh, identifying and acknowledging your sin and repenting. And so these were people, the, the tax collectors and the sinners that were with them, were people that recognized and knew that they were sinners. If anyone has seen a guy called Ray Comfort, um, he often challenges people uh, in the street about whether they're sinners or not, and they start off by saying, no, no, I'm a good person, and then he says, well, have you ever stolen? Have you ever lied? Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? And, and each time, well, yes, I have. Well, yes, I have. Yes, I've done that. So you're telling me that you're a lying, cheating, fornicating, you know, and all these things. And, you know, he, he, he really challenges people to see that they are sinners. But that's, that's the big problem because very often in society, people think that they're good, don't they? Think that we're good people and we deserve but we deserve heaven when we know how good and holy God is and how sinful we really are. We really know how much we don't, don't deserve heaven. So Jesus sought out those that really knew. And the Pharisees and the religious people really hated that because they were the ones who were thinking that they were good. They were good people and they, they, they obeyed the law and they stuck to the law. Jesus likened it to someone who, um, who needs a doctor. And it's quite, quite interesting that right at this moment, my father is suffering from some a bilious sort of problem. And he's been suffering for, from it for a little while, you know, a week or so now. And I said to him, we really need to call out a doctor, Dad. You know, it's, it's about a doctor. No, I don't need a doctor. I'm fine. And 
He clearly doesn't think he needs a doctor, but clearly he does need a doctor. He needs someone to come out and check him out and hopefully to give him something that will cure his problem. So this is the way Jesus addressed the Pharisees. He was saying to them, you know, people that know they need a doctor will go to a doctor. You clearly don't see that you need salvation. Jesus can only save those that realize, those self-confessed sinners. Now, interestingly, there's over 2 billion people unreached in the world today. There's 2, 2 billion people that have never heard the gospel. At the same time, there's about 2 billion people, more than 2 billion people, uh, who profess to be Christian. 2 billion people in this world who profess to be Christian. And I just want to challenge you and challenge us. So who is our target group? Are we targeting those who have never heard the gospel? Well, clearly we can't. Uh, for most of us, we can't reach. We can give to ministries, but can't reach those. But that two million, out of that two million, sorry, two billion who claim to be Christian, we know that many of those people have really never uh, understood or heard the gospel or maybe never been, yeah, preached the gospel in their churches. So these people could be people that go to church. They may be friends of yours that, that are attending churches. The problem is, is that it's quite embarrassing, isn't it, when you talk to someone who goes to church to find out whether they're saved. That, that can be quite a difficult conversation and where do you start, and what do you say, and how do you broach it? And you don't want to offend them because they're your friends. But is it loving not to share the gospel with them? One of the most dangerous places, as we can see from this scripture, is being religious and self-righteous. And what a terrible place to be, that you maybe you spend your whole life trying to be good, Spend your whole life going to church and, and doing all the things. And then when you get to heaven, Jesus says, I never knew you. It's a terrible place to be. You may as well go out and be reveling and partying and, you know, clubbing and doing all these things because you're spending all your life doing something that is not good. I have a couple of students in my class who um, first, uh, when I first arrived, um, they, they came up to me and declared that they were Christians because they knew I was a Christian. They were so excited and they were part of the worship team and you know, they were really involved in their church. But over time, they sort of started to become disillusioned with what was happening. in them. And I shared the gospel with them. And they'd never heard it. Now, these, these kids, they're not young. They're 17. Uh, they're, they were in the worship team. You know, they were part of a church. Um, and they'd never heard the gospel. They didn't understand the gospel. So I shared the gospel with them and explained everything about the gospel. And at the end of it, I said to them, so um, what do you think? And, and one of them said, well, um, I, no, sorry, I, I said, do you think, are you going to go to heaven? You know, I've shared, the, well, I'm a good person. I'm a good person, she said. And uh, if anyone's heard of family fortunes, that would have been a, because <clears throat> that's clearly the wrong answer. The right answer is I'm a bad person. You know, I used to listen to a guy, um, a guy called Kenneth Copeland, many years ago. And he would belittle, really very much ridicule, preachers that said, I'm a sinner saved by grace. He would very much ridicule, ridicule that because he would say, no, no, no. You know, I, I'm a son of the Most High. I'm this. I'm a God. You know, all these sort of things. And it's so sad because it's exactly what we are. 
We're no better than anyone. Saved by the grace of God, by the mercy of God. So to say I'm a good person, not the right answer. So I, I shared a bit more with, with the two of them and I said, so what are you going to do about it? Do you want, do you want to, me to pray with you now? Do you want to? And they said, well, I want to think about it. The problem is, is sin. Clearly, I knew immediately that there were some issues because if you know the gospel and you believe in Christ and you're presented the gospel, you know you, you need to repent. And if you haven't repented, as Jesus said here, if you don't realize that you need to repent, then you can't receive salvation that he offers. So I'm praying for them. Please keep them up in your prayers um, that they will come to repentance. But that sin in their lives stops them. Well, you know, I don't really want to leave that behind. It's a big thing because Jesus said, unless you're willing to give up everything, you don't deserve to follow me. We're not worthy of following me. Know that we're not perfect when we give our lives to Christ. It, it's then a process of sanctification. But there's many people um, in, who identify as, as Christians really don't really know Christ. Never been confronted with their sin never repented of their sin truly, truly turned to Jesus was here, was speaking to those religious people who thought they were good. Really, they were relying on their own self-righteousness. Do you rely on your own self-righteousness? Do you know people that rely on their own self-righteousness? We need to share the gospel. In love, we need to share the gospel to these people. I just feel that there's, there's, a, there's a big field amongst people that identify, that's a popular word, identify as Christians, that we can reach. And if we love them, then we'll share the true gospel with them. So, I think about the Philippines. The Philippines is a, a heavily Catholic nation. And probably, uh, I don't know, 90% of, of the people of the Philippines would, would call themselves Christians. Although, in fairness, a lot of the Catholics say, no, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Catholic. But there is a nation where you can see so many people who are Worshipping um, idols and worshipping things that are not through Christianity. Massive nation. The good thing about reaching people that you know that are churched is you haven't got to convince them that Christ is real. You haven't got to, because they believe all that bit. They understand and they believe. Just that most of them have never really been presented with the gospel. You know, these, this, this couple who for most of their 17 years of their life have been in church, they've been brought up in church, never heard the gospel. So it's a challenge to us, amen? Challenge to us to, to reach people that, you know, maybe it's uncomfortable to, to talk about and to, uh, to approach, but if you love them, um, you'll find a way to share the gospel with people even though they go to church. But they go to church and you think, oh, I, I don't say anything to them. But they need to hear the gospel. They may be in a church where the gospel is not properly preached. We're very blessed here that we hear the gospel every week. I love that about this church. I love that about this church. Tickling down my eyes. I really, I say that, I love that about this church. They always preach the gospel. I'm so grateful. Russell and Ben, always bring the gospel to us. You can never leave here without 
hearing. Then, okay. Well, I think that's. We're going to sing in response to what we've heard as we recognise that the Lord Jesus is the one that we're able to depend on, that he is our righteousness, he is the very best, and so we are safe to trust in him. Let's stand and hum and sing together. I once held you. Lord Jesus, we do love you and we are grateful that you are the one who pursues us, pursues those who do not deserve it, even to the extent of going to the cross for us. Thank you that because you have died our death, we are free. Thank you that you give us your righteousness. Please would you help us to live in the light of that as joyful people who are sure and certain of who we belong to and where we are going. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the great victory that you have won for us, and we give you all our praise. And we pray. Amen. We close our service together. Let's remember the grace that's been lavished on us as we... That includes those of you back home on Zoom. Glad to unmute your microphones and say... Together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, and all. Way out the back.